G'day and welcome back to The Shed. Tonight we're going to take a look at Larry Niven's Ringworld. When this novel came out, it won the Hugo and the Nebula in 1970, and the book is regarded by many as the first real hard sci-fi novel that sort of led the way and paved the road for people like Peter F. Hamilton and others that came after him. So we find the book begins with the year being around 2850 and this guy called Louis Wu who's celebrating his 200th year birthday. And what we find is that Lewis is getting a bit bored with life and is looking for some action. And it just so happens that he's approached by this alien being from the race of puppeteers with a bit of a proposition. And so Larry, I thought, did a really good job of describing this alien creature, so much so that I thought I'd have a go at drawing it. <laughs> so, you know, just to give you a rough idea what these puppeteers look like. Um, and that was purely based on Larry's description. So it's, I thought he did a really good job of describing the alien beings. So the puppeteer comes to Louis Liu with this proposition um, and he's recruiting some people to help him fly his starship and he's promised them a faster than light starship. So there's a big carrot hanging on the back of this um, proposal. And what we find is that the puppeteer wants to hire Louis Wu as well as another alien being from a race called the Kazin or Kazin or Zin, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it, who are a cat-like, uh, very warrior-like race and they have had uh, wars with human beings as well. So there's a bit of conflict there initially between the Kazin in Speaker to Animals, his name is, and Louis Wu, the Earthling. He also goes ahead and hires another earthling in a lady called Tila. So the puppeteer then starts breaking down what they're actually in search of and that is one of the highlights of the novel because what we find is that the puppeteer are a race that are, are cowards basically. They just hate, they, they fear, they're very scared creatures, they fear just about anything and their natural response is to roll themselves up in a ball and basically go into this comatose state uh, because the fear overwhelms them. And what they've discovered is terrifying them. And that sort of sparked Lewis, Lewis Wu's sort of interest as to well, what could it be so scary that um, has frightened this very advanced technological race in the puppeteers, right? So these puppeteers have got great technology, they're way superior than the earthlings and the Gizin combined. So this has sort of raised Lewis's Wu's interest and he joins the puppeteer in his quest to visit this ring world. And what we find is that this ring world is not a natural construct. So it seems, it appears to be a man-made construct or at least an alien being man-made or, you know, handmade <laughs> construct that en envelops a sun. So this thing is astronomical and is absolutely awesome in the true sense of the word. And Larry Niven, I think, has done a pretty good job of just describing how incredibly large this ring world is because it's something like 600 million miles in length. And I think it has a radius of something like 186 million miles. This thing is absolutely gigantic. Uh, one of the oceans alone would fit the whole Earth into it, if not Mars as well. So it's absolutely gigantic. And I remember reading through the book several times where I thought, now this is truly awesome. What a great idea. What great imagination to come up with the concept of the ring world. So I thought that was absolutely brilliantly done. Um, and he brings his own sort of math. He's, I think he's got a mathematics and a physics degree behind him as well. So he brings a lot of hard science facts that really makes the world believable from a scientific sense, right? So you do get to say, so, hey, this is potentially a reality. So they go and visit this world, but and due to some circumstances, they find themselves crash landing on the ring world. And then the book goes through a series of journeys where they go through and try to actually, you know, recover their vessel. So it's an interesting blend, this book. Um, I remember when I first read it 25 years ago, I remember really enjoying the novel and it hasn't really changed that much. I, and I do remember most of it, which is like extraordinary for these novels that I haven't picked up in decades. But I read through the Ring World and I remembered a lot of it. 
especially the concept of the ring roller. And I think that's what stands out to me as the strongest element and the strongest idea in this book. Just the concept of the ring world alone is worthwhile reading the book. What I will say though is that this time around when rereading this novel, the characters were forgettable and I think they still are forgettable. I didn't really remember the characters at all. I didn't remember Louis Wu at all. As interesting as the puppeteer was, I couldn't remember much of the puppeteer. Uh, mind you, right, I've read hundreds, if not thousands, of science fiction novels over the years. So I've met a lot of alien races through my journeys in sci-fi. Uh, but, you know, is it a memorable alien? Well, it didn't last the test of time for me. I, I really didn't remember much about the puppeteer. Nor did I really remember much about the Gizin, which I thought was a more interesting alien being. And especially from a character perspective, I think Gizin had a lot more to offer than the puppeteer. But yeah, I, I would say that the uh, the characters in the book are, are sort of forgettable. And what you get with Louis Wu, I mean, this guy is 200 years old. But you would never know from his actions or what he, you know, what, how he handles himself. He just looks like a middle-aged, or it sounds like a middle-aged guy who's just going through life and doing what he does. So I thought that was a bit lacking. There was nothing really that showed or demonstrated the wisdom or the knowledge that was a, uh, acquired over two, you know, two centuries of life, right? So I thought that was a bit disappointing. I, I would have liked to see Larry Niven explore that area a little bit more. Uh, now, Tila or Tina, what's her name? Uh, I'll have to flick it out. But I'm pretty sure it was Tila. It just goes to show how forgettable she was. I mean, for most of the novel, all she does is play um, second fiddle to Louis Wu and just a bit of eye candy for him. They have something on and off for a little bit of the novel. But the only thing about Tina or Tila or whatever her name was, pardon me, I really should have uh, put the name to memory. Uh, but the only thing about her that makes her interesting is that she's lucky, right? So the, the puppeteers have gone through some breeding program and the result is this extraordinarily lucky person. So it doesn't talk to anything about fate. It, it just pure luck is what Tilo is all about, which I sort of thought was a bit, a bit shallow, right? And I think that's my, my only real concern with the novel is that all the, all the characters were single faceted. Right, so you had Louis Wu, who's this earthling guy who's 200 years old and he's doing life the way he wants to do it. You had this warrior person in the Kazin, speaker to animals, who just this fearsome warrior and the only emotion he shows is, you know, strength and um, a fighting ability. You have Tila, that the only attribute she can bring to the novel is her luck and her good looks. Uh, and you have this puppeteer race who just... A bunch of cowards and and they were very pigeonholed right it's not like the puppeteer ever showed a bit of strength or a bit of courage nor did say the cuisine show a bit of um, emotion or compassion it, they were just very single faceted which I thought would have been nice to see a different side of the cuisine or the puppeteers and Tiller and for example Lewis Wu but look these are real mild criticisms right um, the other thing I found interesting this time around reading the book is I found the whole narrative a bit disjointed at times. I don't know, there were just certain jumps in the narrative that sometimes made you sort of double check and say, hey, am I, did, I, did I flick two pages here instead of the one that I was turning pages? So I don't know, there, there was an element of that in the novel that I found distracting at times. Um, but overall, it was a very enjoyable read. Larry Niven's Ringworld. So the pros, you know, let, let's go through it a bit more systematically. So the pros really, for me, I, I did find myself there at times thinking, wow, right? And, and it's not often that I, I get like that with novels where you think, wow, <laughs> what a great idea. Oh, wow. Imagine something like The Ring World. How fantastic and truly awesome would it be to come across something like The Ring World? So I thought that were the pros. Really, the single story, the single biggest theme is around the ring world. Uh, and I think that's a pretty good artistic um, view of what the ring world looks like. To show you that blob in the middle there is supposed to represent the sun, or a, a sun, or not a sun, a star, I should say. Uh, it should represent a star, and that's the size of the ring world. Um, 
So it's absolutely a fantastic idea. Uh, and one that alone is worthwhile reading. And like I said, and the science behind it makes it almost believable. The dislikes, like I said, I thought that the characters were a bit shallow. Um, I thought the plot was a bit erratic at times. Uh, the treatment of women in the novel wasn't that great either. Um, I mean, Tila was just eye candy and something that Louis Wu could sort of, you know, get in touch with, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, and it's... And that's all she was really in the novel, um, which was a bit disappointing. So, um, so the memory, the, the memory test that I've been putting to this novel, I would say that Ringworld holds pretty good to that. Um, I, I read, like I said, this book 25 years ago, and the concept of the Ringworld, I don't think I'll ever forget. Right? <laughs> I don't think I'll ever forget the concept of the Ringworld. Um, it's been 25 years, and. I still I felt awe again when I read the book and I thought, wow, what a fantastic thing is this ring world. But unfortunately, I feel the characters and everything else were just, and the plot in some ways, was pretty forgettable. But on the, on a finishing note on this, um, i got to say, you know, there, there are not that many books that when you read the last sentence of the book, you know, you, you, you finish with a smile on my face. And that's exactly what I did last night when I finished this novel. I, I read through the last sentence and I had a big smile on my face. I thought, yeah, how cool is the ring world, right? So it is that kind of novel. It's a very enjoyable read and one that I thoroughly enjoyed. So who would I recommend this book to then? Um, look, I don't know if I would recommend it to new sci-fi readers. It, it's... Unless you're really well versed with science fiction, or maybe maybe that's not fair to say, but I get the feeling that for new science fi new science fiction readers, I don't often recommend hard sci-fi novels. It's a bit harder to swallow, I find, for most people. So it's not the kind of novel that I would recommend to a first reader. I wouldn't say this is the hardest sci-fi book I've ever read. It's actually quite um, approachable in many ways. But it is definitely considered hard sci-fi and I can see why that is. So I don't know if I would recommend it to new readers. But I would definitely recommend it to people like you know that love someone like Peter F. Hamilton. Um, things like the Pandora Star and some of these other great novels. Uh, and also uh, Alistair Reynolds. Uh, I think if you like those kind of novels and you have not written, uh, you've not read a lot of um, vintage science fiction, I would say have a go at Ringworld. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised. But be mindful of the caveat that I mentioned, right? Is I think the, some of the science fiction is very good. But it was written in, a, in 1970, so some of the science, if you're a hard science nut, you'll find it has dated a bit, uh, but the concepts I think are still very much enjoyable. Be aware of the minor disjointed sort of narrative that pops up now and then. I found it a little bit distracting to be honest, um, and the not so well developed characters. So keep that in mind, but remember, right, I'm being extremely critical here because I'm trying to rank and prepare myself for what I need to do here and rank these novels on the Hugo and Nebula Award winning ladder behind me because they're all great novels, right? I, I keep reiterating that every single week I do these reviews because I don't want to dissuade you from reading what is an absolutely fantastic book. And I want to, if I leave you with anything, if you remember anything at all from this review, I want you to remember this. When I finished that last sentence of the book, I had a smile from ear to ear and it must have been about half past 11 at night and I had the biggest smile on my face and I went to sleep with a big smile on my face, right? It is a very much enjoyable novel, uh, one that I think you will enjoy. So, shall we go to the shared ladder and see how we rank it? Let's do it. So let's take a look at the leaderboard and see where we're going to rank Larry Niven's 1970 Hugo and Nebula award winning novel. And they're not getting any easier. <laughs> they're definitely not getting any easier. So let's maybe start from the bottom uh, with Kat Wilhelm's Where Late the Sweet Bird Sang. And yeah, I would say that Ringworld is better than the Where Late the Sweet Bird Sang. And the main reason is the concept of the Ringworld is a very strong one and one that is awe-inspiring. I've never forgotten the concept of the, uh, the Ringworld. And I can't say the same for that post-apocalyptic novel. The concept of the um, the clones in the book never really stuck. It never really passed the 
the test of time for me so it was a, a pretty forgettable concept for me and nothing really new which is quite the contrast to Ringworld um, is it better than Babel 17 from a concept point of view I think they're both very strong so I think the concept of the linguistic relativity in Babel 17 is a strong one and one that I remembered as well um, and with Babel 17 even you know, I would I'll put it on par as far as the char character development and the depth of character in, in you know portrayed in the novel. Very similar to Babel Seventeen, Ringworld is. Um, so very interesting in that sense. They both passed the test of time, but I would have to give it to Ringworld again uh, over Babel Seventeen because the alien creatures are a lot more interesting than any of the characters in Babel Seventeen. It was only a few weeks ago now where I read Babel 17 and apart from Wong, I think her name was, see this is how forgettable those characters are. <laughs> I've already forgotten the rest of the characters and what they had to bring to the table. So the characters were not very great in Babel 17 and I'd never liked the ending where Ringworld left me with a smile on my face. So I can't forget that, right, when it comes to ranking it. Ringworld did leave me with a smile on my face where Babel 17 left me with a sour taste in my mouth. So that's definitely better than that. Is it better than Flowers for Algernon? Yeah, again, for the same reasons that I've pointed out in the past. Flowers for Algernon, for me, is an absolutely wonderful piece of fiction. Not necessarily science fiction. There's not a, a lot of science fiction in that novel. And I think Ringworld is the complete contrast to that. Very strong sci-fi elements. And the concept of the Ringworld is just absolutely awesome. I honestly was reading it a few times and I went, wow, right? <laughs> it's not often that book makes me go, wow. And, and this one definitely does. So I'll say it is better than Flowers for Algernon. Is it better than The Demolished Man by Alfred Bester? Ah, oh, yeah, I'm going to say yeah. I'm going to say yes, it is. I, I loved Alfred Bester's The Demolished Man. But I think the concept, purely on the concept, I think the ring, you know, the demolished man, I think I enjoyed the story more so, right? But the ring world is a very strong sci-fi concept that I think is stronger than the, the, the demolished man. I mean, I, it has some pretty neat science fiction elements, the demolished man, don't get me wrong, I really do enjoy that book. I liked all, I like all these books, right? Um, but I think the ring world concept is stronger than the demolished man. Is it better than This Immortal by Roger Zelazny? Nah, I'm gonna have to say, is it better than, oh man, this is a difficult one. I know Ringworld is a, a fan favorite. I know there are a lot of people that absolutely love Ringworld and would rank it right up there, right? So is it better than This Immortal? Maybe let's come back to it. Is it better than The Left Hand of Darkness? From a sci-fi concept, I think it is. I think it's a very strong sci-fi concept. And it does, oh, this is an interesting one, and it does have the test of time. Like it does definitely pass my memory test that I've been putting to this. But The Left and the Darkness is such a much better written book. So this is going to be really interesting. This Immortal, The Left Hand of Darkness, is it better, better than Forever War? Left Hand of Darkness or This Immortal? Maybe I need to start planning these beforehand, eh? <laughs> because you're, you're watching my full mind meld here going on. Um, and it's definitely not, not easy, but I want to be spontaneous with you guys. Um, if you want me to change the format, if you want me to be a bit more uh, quicker and not deliberate so much on what I do for choices, please drop a note and I will... Um, you know satisfy you guys but i thought it's a bit of fun trying to see how i come up with these things in my head right um so that's why for now i'll, I'll keep it like this um so left end of darkness didn't pass the memory test but it's a much read, better written book this immortal ring world there were some definitely some areas in ring world where I, uh, I did, didn't like it as much as this immortal. The Hugo for 1966 Ringworld. You know what? It's going to be difficult, but I think I'm going to put it right, 
right there so hesitantly let's uh, let's place it here for now and let's have a bit of a think about it ring world by larry niven the demolished man great concept about motive opportunity and method timeless concepts ring world an unforgettable awesome concept in a ring world in a true sense of the word it's not going to best okay so it's definitely not going to best the left hand of darkness that is just a very good written book and although it didn't pass the test of time for me that was a really enjoyable book throughout there, there was not one section in the novel where i thought ah right it was a great book it just did not pass the test of time so no it's not going to be better than the left hand of darkness is it better than this immortal no i enjoyed this immortal more i like the complexity of the character in uh, conrad right nomikos whatever his name was so i thought the character and the story the mix of mythology the pacing of the book well, no definitely this immortal was better than Ringworld. Is it better than Demolished Man? Yeah, okay, that's 100% where we're going to leave it, guys. Jeez, that was tough. That was really, really, really tough. But I'm happy with that. And the reason I think it's going to be better than the Demolished Man is because that concept of the ring world is a very strong one. Um, the Demolished Man is a wonderfully written novel. I really did thoroughly enjoy it. Um, but I think I'm going to be happy with that, where that sits today. And it wasn't going to be better than Forever War until you just got it. So the others were pretty straightforward. It was going to always sit somewhere in the middle there. Um, but that's where we sit. I don't know. What do you think? Have I done the book justice? I think it's a great book. All of these, I keep saying it every week. They're all very good books. But I think I'm happy with that. Yeah, let's lock it in. Lock it in, Eddie. Lock it in. Um, for those of you who don't know, it was an Australian show. Um the lock it in eddie bit <laughs> anyway i'm rambling i don't know so hey i've been peter this has been the sci-fi shed i think that has been to date the most difficult decision we've made um because i really 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 do enjoy ring world um and just one last thing right ring world for me and rendezvous with rama i've always put them very side by side as two great books relating to this awesome artificial thing uh, and what does it mean so it'd be really really interesting when we go read um, Rendezvous with Rama again and see how that compares uh, it's been years decades again since I read uh, Rendezvous with Rama so it'd be really interesting to see how difficult that one will be to rank but hey here yeah, well thank you <laughs> thank you for being patient and watching me struggle through that and I'll see you next time in the shed